It's um, great to see you all here. I hope everybody enjoyed lunch um, with Detroit Soul. Uh, Detroit Soul is an up-and-coming uh, food provider in the city of Detroit, neighborhood-based business, and I'm really happy they were able to come here today uh, to help sustain us all. Um, I'm uh, going to introduce Wade, and then Wade, uh, after his remarks, will introduce the panel. Um, Wade Henderson, I need my glasses for this. Uh, Wade Henderson recently retired as the David A. Clark School of Law's first Joseph L. Raw, Jr. Chair of Public Interest Law. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Responsible Lending. And um, from 1996 to 2017, um, Wade Henderson was the leader of the Washington Conference on uh, Civil and Human Rights, which is a uh, absolutely essential and fantastic um, organization in Washington, D.C. that brings together uh, the civil rights community around really critical issues in public policy. And I found in my time in Washington, I first uh, met Wade um, back uh, when he first started at the, um, at the conference in, in 1996 when I was serving in the Clinton administration. I got a chance to work with him and with the conference on um, fair lending issues and on the Community Reinvestment Act and chance to work together again in the Obama administration. And I always relied on Wade for uh, a wonderful mixture of um, deep substantive um, knowledge, a, a real strong um, political um, sense, a deep moral commitment um, to the issues at hand, and um, that rare Washington trait, um, common sense. <clears throat> so I'm uh, deeply grateful um, to Wade Henderson for being here. Uh, among his many um, honors and achievements, um, he is a graduate of Howard University uh, and Rutgers University School of Law. Uh, he's gotten honorary degrees from a number of institutions, including CUNY School of Law and Gettysburg, Gettysburg College. He's a member of the Bar of Washington, D.C. and of the Supreme Court Bar, and I'm delighted to welcome him here to the Ford School of Public Policy. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Come on, wake up, guys. It was a great lunch. Wake up. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be with you. And uh, Michael, thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, I appreciate it. I want to thank the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy for the invitation to participate in this extraordinarily important conference. The Gerald Ford School is an incredibly distinguished venue, and it's perfect for our discussion about consumer protection in an age of uncertainty. Now, because this is the last panel, I want to take the liberty of thanking the organizers for the extraordinary job they have done in pulling this together. Christy, you, Tracy, you know. It's really been a first-rate production, and so thank you so much for your generosity. And the lunches, both today and yesterday, were quite extraordinary. I uh, normally thank the wait staff in places that I go because I know how hard it is to serve food. I used to do that myself, so I do appreciate that, but it was really well done. Now, I'm excited uh, to be a part of a conversation on the pitfalls of student loan debt. It's an important topic that has for far too long traveled under the policy radar in Washington and in far too many state capitals. Uh, my colleagues on the panel are distinguished and groundbreaking advocates. I'm going to have the opportunity to introduce them individually at the end of what I hope are my pretty brief remarks, but I'm really especially pleased uh, to be with all of them. And as most of you know, as Michael mentioned, I'm the immediate past president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, but I'm here today in my capacity as a senior fellow with the uh, Center for Responsible Lending, and I want to thank my colleagues at the Center for their terrific research on the issue of student loan debt and for their help in preparing my remarks. Now, I decided to uh, entitle uh, my presentation, Good Debt, Bad Debt the seamy underside of the student debt crisis, which I hope is sufficiently provocative to keep you awake after all of that food this afternoon. So we'll go from there. Uh, before I begin, I would like to take a minute 
to offer a couple of preliminary uh, comments. Uh, first, I really do want to acknowledge Michael Barr. Michael was very generous in his comments about me. Uh, I'm not a person that Michael hired in his uh, <laughs> tenure to, uh, one of the few here at the conference, apparently. But uh, I did want to lift Michael up because when I met him, he was a young policy wonk in DC, fresh out of law school, maybe three years or so. And uh, we conspired together to actually increase the level of civil rights enforcement funding across the board. Michael was at OMB. And because of his work, because of Frank Raines, whom he worked for, but really because of, of Michael's commitment to the issue, we were able to increase the level of civil rights enforcement funding at unprecedented levels. And I give Michael a lot of credit for that because it really took commitment and you know, knowledge and substance and how to, to work the system, if you will, to produce that result. And it was a really good outcome. So Michael, thank you uh, for that. It was really important. Uh, I also really uh, would be remiss if I didn't also take a minute. Look, I'm here in Michigan, guys, right? <laughs> if I didn't acknowledge two of your native sons, who, uh, in my view, uh, I can't come to Michigan without mentioning them. They are the 43rd and 44th deans of the House of Representatives, two of the longest serving members in Congress. John Dingell, who served from 1955 until 2015, chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and John Conyers, chair of the House Judiciary Committee, who was no slouch himself to congressional service. He came in in 1965 and served until December of 2017. Now I mentioned, yeah, now they deserve, thank you, they deserve, they deserve credit. John Dingell really prided himself on being involved in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That was his proudest achievement. <laughs> but John Dingell was also responsible for Medicare, the Clean Water Act, and he helped lead the fight on the Affordable Care Act. You don't get better service than that, and it should be remembered. John Conyers took great pride in being involved in the 65 Voting Rights Act, in the Fair Housing Act, of 1968, 1988, the Matthew Shepard, James Byrd hate crimes bill, and many criminal justice laws that help promote reform. We are unlikely to see two individuals with that same level of impact again, and to know that they are here in spirit in Michigan is an important reminder. I stand on the shoulders of people like John Dingell and John Kanye, so thanks for indulging me. Um, now, my final preliminary <laughs> remark, guys, and I'm going to keep it short, I promise, it's my final preliminary remark, is really a prelude uh, to my remarks this afternoon. And that is a reference to the college admissions cheating scandal, uh, which has hit several elite universities and prominent individuals, including Hollywood celebrities, and which has roiled the higher education community. Now, I'm quite sure I don't have to elaborate extensively on my views about the uh, cheating scandal or, as its chief organizer referred to it, the so-called side door to opportunity uh, for the sons and daughters of the wealthy, a door that only money could buy uh, to attend an elite college or university. I was, uh, I was struck, especially by, really almost immediately, by the hypocrisy of those who focus on the alleged unfairness of affirmative action, uh, which arguably this university knows more about than many others because of the Grutter versus Bollinger lawsuit of early 2000, uh, while they say at the same time they ignore the admissions from university preferences for legacy or the effect of fraud and white privilege. Uh, but actually there are larger issues at play. Now I'm sure these cases and the resulting prosecutions having gotten the national attention they've received, will run their course. However, questions about the true meaning of equal opportunity in American life through public education loom large. And how we determine who gets into our better schools will remain unresolved long after the cheating scandals have been forgotten. Now this is not the venue for me to make my argument in favor of a federal right to quality public education in contrast to the 50 state education fiefdoms that dominate America today and routinely disfavor 
students of color and the poor. But it is a place to remind us that de jure segregation, which is a nationwide phenomenon with its history of inequality, is baked into our education system, K to 12, and in the post-secondary world as well. Now, as a result, as Lisa Rice pointed out on the previous panel, structural inequality, which is deepened by poverty and the expanding wealth gap, is the backdrop against which the American student loan debt crisis must be viewed. Now, there was a time, not too long ago, when student loan debt was considered good debt in consumer speak. Good debt is defined as an investment that will grow in value or generate long-term income, and student loans have long been considered a relatively wise investment. Student loans, of course, typically had very low interest rates compared to other types of debt, and the payoff seemed all but guaranteed. It was also good debt because it's been drilled into our heads since early childhood that education was the gateway to opportunity in American life. But somewhere along the way, things got out of hand. For all but the very highest income brackets, student loans are now a necessity. A while ago, college students took out loans and or held jobs uh, to pay for their education. Pell Grants, which were readily available to low-income students, regardless of color, have diminished in value because they haven't been increased uh, over a period of years, so it pays for less and less. And then parents, and in some cases grandparents or other relatives, began taking on loans. Each year of enrollment brought new loans, often with higher interest rates, and a new kind of consumer debt was born. And while we use the term student debt, what we're really referring to is family debt that affects multiple generations. I guarantee you there are people in this audience who are subsidizing the education of their own children when they, in fact, are now moving, meaning the individuals themselves, into their retirement years. So the growth of outstanding student loan debt over the last decade has been staggering. Today, more than 44 million people carry over $1.5 trillion in outstanding student loan debt, an amount that exceeds all other types of non-mortgage loan debt. Two out of three graduates in the class of 2017 borrowed federal student loans to finance their education. And this phenomenon is especially troubling for communities of color because the wealth gap makes the burden of student loan debt particularly heavy for African-American and Latino families. Now, I want to remind everyone, this conference, the Consumer Conference, talked about the mortgage and recession crisis of 2008. African-Americans lost about 40% of their collective wealth, 40%. The ACLU has just issued a new report. I, I'm surprised. I was an ACLU lawyer, by the way, so I'm thrilled that they did it. But the ACLU has issued a report which said that by 2031, by 2031, African Americans will have, in effect, lost about $100,000 in net wealth because of the recession of 2008. $100,000. Uh, guys, what we are looking at, you know, wealth in, in 2013, uh, as a result of the recession, was 13 times less for African Americans than it was for white families. So the truth is, you're already starting from a phenomenally unequal position, made worse because of structural inequality, and made more difficult because individuals don't have the capacity to pay back the loans even though at the time they took them, they thought they might. Families of color are more likely to, to have a need to borrow for higher education and in larger amounts. And following graduation, those who earn lower relative incomes simply have less to work with, which contributes to a higher likelihood of delinquency and default. And in fact, recent research shows that rather than helping communities of color build wealth, a college education deepens the wealth gap. For example, young African Americans take on 85% more student debt than their white counterparts for their education, 
and that difference in indebtedness increases by almost 7% per year after leaving school. Now, it's critical to note that delinquency and default on student loans occur disproportionately for students of color and women. A degree is not a shield from racial or gender disparities. African-American bachelor's degree graduates default at five times the rate of white graduates and are more likely to default than whites who never finish a degree. Women graduates, on average, with $2,700 more in student loan debt than men. And because of the gender pay gap, they earn about 26% less. So paying off their debt takes significantly longer. If you set aside the question of whether these individuals are simply immoral, that is to say they're taking the loans and they have no intention of paying them back and you know, no matter what their circumstances are, that's what they're doing. If you set that argument aside, because I think that's terribly untrue, then the evidence of the disparities that we see are deeply disturbing and suggest that without some attention, the problem is only going to worsen. Excuse me. <coughs> and while student loan debt is often seen as a millennial issue, the crisis leaves no age group untouched. AARP is increasingly concerned about student loan debt affecting the financial stability of older Americans. Student loan debt held by borrowers over the age of 60 increased by more than 50 percent between 2012 and 2017. According to the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, the increase in loan debt among seniors means that many more are spending their golden years struggling uh, because of the federal government's ability to garnish Social Security income for repayment of federal student loan debt. And it has been argued that the inability to discharge student loans in bankruptcy increases the problem. Now, there are some exceptions to that rule. Uh, but the truth is, if you can't discharge that debt, you are now entering your retirement years, and you are relying on Social Security as your primary source of income. You're in deep, deep trouble, guys, deep trouble. So according to the Department of Education, for just one year of undergraduate instruction, a full -time, as a full-time student at a private nonprofit school during 2017-2018 academic year, the cost averaged about $28,000, an increase of approximately 3% higher than the previous academic year. Similarly, the department found that the cost of full-time enrollment at public institutions offering a four-year degree also rose for these same two academic years. In-state students enrolled full-time at public colleges and universities faced a 2% increase in costs amounting to $8,300. Out-of-state students attending the same colleges and universities faced an average cost of $28,000. And yet few employed people had corresponding increases uh, in income. Now, I'm not going to discuss the, the you know, median income of you know, the various communities. I have that information. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk with you after the panel. <laughs> but the truth is, you know as well as I do, that women, people of color, don't measure up to the median income of white families. And so when we talk about student loan debt, even though they may be borrowing the same amount under the same terms, the impact of that borrowing has a decidedly different effect on those communities. So, so while 250, oh, student loan debts, I'm sorry, loan defaults degrade credit scores, lowering them by as much as 50 to 90 points according to the Urban Institute, which is a DC-based uh, research organization. And as credit scores drop, the cost of any future credit goes up, making it even harder for affected consumers to manage their personal finances. While 250,000 federal direct student loan borrowers default every quarter, guess which consumers are most likely to default? We've already discussed that, so I won't go further beyond it. So, Beyond a four-year baccalaureate degree and graduate uh, schools, today's educational options for include varied careers and technical training programs in such fields as healthcare, computers, cosmetology, criminal justice, 
fashion design, and the entertainment business. Prominent among the institutions offering this educational medley are for-profit colleges that use marketing strategies to target financially vulnerable consumers. Then complete enrollment and financial aid applications as quickly as possible. Now these institutions even encourage debt beyond what is needed to pay tuition and fees. This year, the Center for Responsible Lending's research found that for-profit colleges represent twin traps of poor outcomes and costly debts that together often lead to loan defaults. Across the nation, for-profit college loan defaults occur at a rate three times that of students enrolled in either public or private institutions, offering four-year or two-year studies. And the sad result for these for-profit uh, students is that they wind up in worse financial circumstances uh, after enrollment. <laughs> All they wanted was educational training to improve their lives. And further, fewer than 30% of for-profit students graduate six years following their enrollment in two or four-year curricula. Now, unfortunately, uh, debt was the primary takeaway from the for-profit college experience. I won't go into the details involving regulatory rollbacks and changes, but it is sufficient to note that the previous administration issued what were known as gainful employment rules, uh, which sought to really hold down, uh, and, and really hold up, rather, uh, to a standard of care for-profit schools that, at this point, exploit uh, students beyond uh, anything reasonable. Just because we know of a school named Trump University uh, that has since gone out of business doesn't mean that all schools are bad, per se. But having said that, there are too many students who suffer in this area, and it's re really worth noting. And I really needn't mention uh, other than to say we followed failures for for-profit schools like Corinthian Colleges, Everest, ITT Tech, that left student borrowers without degrees and credit hours that could not be transferred, and losses to taxpayers who funded uh, federal assistance. Uh, Betsy DeVos, who has chosen to uh, bring her own inimitable analysis uh, to this problem, uh, <laughs> unfortunately has done very little to advance uh, the larger cause. Uh, so this is the backdrop against which today's extraordinary panel is being asked to address. It is my great ple uh, pleasure to introduce today's panel, uh, individuals who I have come to know through this process, and I must say, have deep admiration for. Sam, and they will be uh, presenting in the order that I introduce them. Samuel Levine is Consumer Protection Counsel to the FTC's Commissioner Rohit Chopra, and Rohit, that was a great presentation this morning, so thank you so much for coming to the conference. And uh, Sam is, of course, a worthy representative of the office. Uh, Dan, uh, Sam will be followed by Joseph Sanders, who is the supervising attorney for Consumer Fraud uh, Bureau of the uh, Illinois Attorney General's Office and a student loan ombudsman uh, for the state of Illinois. Great to have you here, uh, Joe. And finally, we'll hear from Dan Zibel, Dan is the Assistant Director for Supervision Policy at the Commuter, I'm sorry, at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving them, did I say it wrong? Uh, You're correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. In any event, uh, let me ask you to join me in welcoming all three of our panelists. Okay. Now, we're going to hear from them uh, individually, and then I'll pose a couple of questions, and then ask the audience to follow up and participate. Sam? Uh, well, I want to start by thanking Professor Henderson. It's really an honor to be on this panel with you and uh, to have met you at this conference. Um, I want to start with a disclaimer. I work for Commissioner Chopra. I hope I'm a good representative of Commissioner Chopra, as Professor Henderson said, but I do not speak for Commissioner Chopra. <laughs> He's perfectly capable of speaking for himself, as we saw this morning. I also certainly don't speak for the Federal Trade Commission as a whole. I'm speaking only for myself. So what I want to talk about today are some of the work that the FTC has done over the last year to take on some of the most abusive practices 
in the higher education space, some of which were referenced by Professor Henderson. But then after that, I sort of have a bad news portion of the talk, how these abuses that the FTC has taken on are symptoms of a much bigger disease in higher education. And when it comes to this much bigger disease in higher education, I fear that our federal government is not on the side of students and our Department of Education is not on the side of students. But first for the good news. So the Federal Trade Commission, for those of you who don't know, is a bipartisan federal agency. Um, it's comprised of five commissioners and it has some independence, like I said, from the administration. Um, and what we do is we enforce, among other things, a prohibition on unfair and deceptive practices. So if a company in the marketplace cheats students or customers, we have the ability to go in and sue them and hopefully stop those practices. Now we've used that power in, in the higher ed space in two key areas over the last year, and I'll talk about each in turn. The first is in the lead generation space, and the second is in student loan debt relief. So let me start with uh, lead generation. So if you've never heard of lead generation, all it is is someone who tries to connect a company looking for customers and potential customers. The lead generators in the middle trying to connect them. In the higher education space, this means connecting schools with potential students. Now, you may be thinking of your, to yourself, especially if you're a student here at the University of Michigan, that's not how I recall going to school. I had to fill out an application and pay someone $10,000 to take my SAT for me. Um, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding, no, 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 no. Um, but seriously, that is not, in, in elite education, that is not the traditional way that you apply to schools. But for most Americans who are going to schools, that it does not resemble applying to the University of Michigan. And there are many schools out there, especially vocational and for-profit programs, who use lead generators to connect them with potential recruits. So the FTC went after a particularly bad lead generator uh, last year called Sunkey. Um, and according to our complaint, what Sunkey did is they basically imitated military recruiters. They set up websites like armyenlist.com and navyenlist.com and they put ads on Google that said, enlist in the Navy, serve your country. And for those students who did want to serve their country, they came across these websites and thought these guys were the military. And these guys said, give us your personal information and we'll get in touch with you about your options. <coughs> so students looking to serve their country call up, or excuse me, they put in their personal information they get a call from someone claiming to be a military recruiter, and they say, hey, it's great that you're interested in the Army, but the Army's downsizing. Have you thought about going to one of these schools that the Army recommends? And the company then, if the company's successful in connecting the school to that student, that school will pay Sunkey about $15 to $40 a lead, directly or indirectly. Now this is an outrageous practice. This is steering people who want to serve their country into predatory, for pro predatory schools, not necessarily for profit, uh, predatory schools that clearly don't have their best interests at heart. Um, I'm proud that the FTC shut this scam down, forced them to turn over their websites, and by the way, to the commissioner's point earlier, sued the individuals who ran the scam, mm. not just the company and they're now under a permanent injunction. But it's important to understand with the lead generation space, and I'm gonna get into more of this later, that what about the schools that were buying these leads? We know there were dozens of schools that decided that this was an okay way to recruit students. And what I'm gonna talk about later is how that is the next battle that we really need to be fighting. Who are these schools that think this is acceptable to prey on students in the way that they did through Sunkey. But I'll get to that in just a minute. The second area where I think the FTC uh, has been active is in student loan debt relief. You may not have heard of student loan debt relief, but I'm sure you've heard from student loan debt relief operators. If you've gotten a phone call in the last five years uh, from an unknown number, it might have said, uh, there is an Obama forgiveness program that expires tomorrow uh, press one and you can see all your loans forgiven. And if you had pressed one and spoken to someone, that someone is a student loan debt relief operator. Except they're probably going to claim the, the Department of Education. 
And they're probably going to claim that to get your loans forgiven or to get your loan payments reduced, you need to pay them $1,000 up front and then $40 a month for the next 20 years. Now, the interesting thing, and Joe's going to talk about this more, is that these debt relief companies did actually, if you had paid them the $1,000, uh, often put students into income-based repayment programs that lower their loan payments. But the reality is that these are free programs. It is free to enroll. These are government programs that taxpayers pay for. And these, these companies were able to do it for two reasons. A, because they lied to students, and B, because the servicers, the actual student loan servicers, who we as taxpayers pay to manage our portfolio of student loans, aren't doing their job. And Joe's going to talk about, Joe's going to talk more about that. But the FTC took on these debt relief companies. We've shut a lot of them down. I think that's a good thing, but one point my commissioner has made and that I am making now is that this is, this is a symptom of a much deeper problem. And now I want to get into what, the, what I see as two of the core structural weaknesses in higher education today that are hurting American students. The first is schools that are treating students as nothing more than a source of revenue. And the second is a, the total lack of accountability for the outcomes that schools are delivering for their students. Total lack of accountability against the schools. So first, I want to talk about the idea of students as revenue. If you're an American citizen, you have a birthright, essentially, to tens of thousands of dollars in federal student loans. I think it's about $57,500 for undergraduate. You can take that 60 grand anywhere you want. Basically, if it's a, you can't go to Trump University with it, but you can, go to a, you can go to a lot of higher ed schools. Well, we live in an entrepreneurial country, and there are a lot of people who thought about this system of higher ed financing and thought, gee, I could make a lot of money like this. I set up a school, and every warm body that walks in the door can bring in tens of thousands of dollars. And that's exactly what's happened in this country uh, over the last 30 plus years. There was a school that Joe and I were involved in prosecuting. It was conceived of at Harvard Business School as a way to make a quick buck. That's, that was the conception of the school. And that's exactly how these schools operate. They, uh, they're run generally for profit. They, they use, they use lead generators like Sunkey to connect them to customers, and then they have admissions counselors. And unlike an admission counselor at University of Michigan, if you're an admission counselor at a predatory for-profit school, you're not an admissions counselor at all. You're a salesperson. They literally take, hire these folks from used car dealerships. We've seen the personnel records. It's true. Those are their star counselors, our used car salesmen, selling people education. And these salespeople understand, because they're not dumb at all, they understand that every student is like a new Lexus for the company they work for. And I did not make that up. That was in the present, that was in the training for these counselors at the school that I referenced earlier. Every student you recruit is a new Lexus. Now, when you have that kind of incentives in place, those kinds of incentives in place, when every student you can bring on is like actually selling a Lexus, of course there's going to be fraud and deceit. Of course you're going to hire companies like Sunkey, uh, these lead generators, to bring in as many warm bodies as you can. You have an overwhelming economic incentive to commit fraud, so we shouldn't be surprised when fraud is exactly what happens. Now, as Professor Henderson referenced, uh, and here's where I get into the issue about the federal government, the Obama administration really made an effort to, um, to crack down on deception to students. Um, they did a number of things, but one thing I, I want to talk about, and Joe was very involved in it, was a rule called Borrower Defense to Repayment that basically said, if a school lied to you in the course of the enrollment, you shouldn't have to keep paying your loans. You can get a discharge of your loans, you can, and you can have some recourse against the school, and that the Department of Education can take some administrative action against the school as well. This was a very basic rule. It would not have solved the problems I'm describing. It would not have fundamentally changed the overwhelming incentives that I'm describing. But it would have mo I think it would have moved the needle and made things a little better and a little less uh, slanted against students. 
Well, instead of moving the ball forward on this, the current administration is rolling it back. And unfortunately for those of us who care about students, there's a rear guard fight going on by the states and by uh, private plaintiffs like Dan's group to try to stop the uh, Trump administration from watering down and rolling back these rules. But my broader point is that I wish I could say we were moving forward on actually making sure schools don't lie to their students, but I fear we're actually moving backward. And given the incentives I described, that's a real problem. The second big failure, big, big failure in higher education is the lack of accountability for outcomes. So I'm gonna go back to the school that Joe and I were involved in prosecuting. This was a school that charged $80,000 for a bachelor's degree that, by the way, wasn't recognized by graduate schools and wasn't recognized by most employers. Well, the consequence was somewhat predictable. The vast, vast, vast majority of students who enrolled did not graduate. Those who graduated could look forward to a median income of $23,000, which is comparable. I believe it's less than what a high school dropout would have been expected to earn. It said these guys are stuck with 80000 in debt. And for the private lending that Professor Henderson described, 90% of students who took out a loan from the school defaulted. This was a train wreck for students. The, this school destroyed the lives of thousands of students even as their private equity owners reap tens of millions of dollars in profit year after year. And that lack of accountability, that system in which you can destroy lives and deliver horrendous outcomes as long as you keep bringing in warm bodies, for as long as you have that kind of incentive structure in place, of course you're going to have student loan debt relief outfits spring up because people are desperate. People come out of these schools, they have no income, they have $100,000 in debt, they're desperate. And when you have desperation, you have fraud. So if we want to stop the desperation, if we want to stop the student don't loan debt relief fraudsters at the core, we need to get at the lack of accountability for the schools that are putting these students in the desperate straits in the first place. Once again, I'm going to echo my refrain from before, the Obama administration tried to do something about this. Professor Henderson referenced it. A lot of us at the state and the Department of Education were involved. Uh, they had a gainful employment rule. It wasn't so radical. It said, if you're a school taking millions of dollars in federal funds and your students aren't able to repay those funds, maybe you shouldn't keep getting millions of dollars in federal funds. This was to protect students, but it was also to protect taxpayers. Why are we subsidizing these private equity schools that are destroying students' lives? Once again, same old story. The, uh, that rule is being rolled back. It's been frozen, and a lot of it's in the courts right now. But once again, gainful employment would not have solved the lack of accountability, but it would have moved us in the right direction. And instead, we're moving in the wrong direction. And there's a rear guard action by people like Joe and Dan to try to just stop the damage. So I want to conclude with this. Uh, Commissioner Chopra has talked a lot about uh, here and elsewhere that to be an effective regulator, you can't just deal with the symptoms of problems. You need to address the core disease. Student loan debt relief, lead generators, these are symptoms of much deeper problems in higher education. And if we're going to address them, if we're actually going to protect students, we need to get at the core disease, the profit motive, the lack of accountability, treating students like AT nothing more than ATMs. <laughs> And that's why I'm so glad to be joined on this panel by Joe and Dan, because they are on the front lines of getting not only at the, at the worst abuses, but also the core problems in higher education that are endangering American students. So thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Sanders. I'm with the Illinois Attorney General's Office. Um, like Sam, I need to let everybody know that uh, the views I'm expressing here today are my own. I don't speak for or bind the uh, Office of the Illinois Attorney General. Um, I want to thank um, the Ford Center and uh, the University of Michigan for having me here today. Uh, I want to thank 
my panelists. I'm really honored to, uh, to be on a panel with so much knowledge about uh, student loans and, and the problem here. Um, and I want to thank uh, Commissioner Chopra, former Student Loan Ombudsman Chopra. Um, I am now the Student Loan Ombudsman for the state of Illinois, and so I am standing on the shoulders of uh, Ombuds Giants. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to build on what Sam talked about. Sam talked about schools and where the loans, you know, the product that the loans are paying for and the problems there. Um, and I'm also going to touch on the defaults that Professor Henderson talked about. Be because as to federal student loans, there are protections in place that should make defaults zero. Income-driven repayment is a repayment system that's based on your income, and if you don't make very much money, your payment is literally zero dollars. And that's considered in good repayment status, you're in these zero dollar payments for 20 to 25 years, and then the loan's forgiven. With the existence of these programs, um, some of which Sam actually helped to create on the negotiated rulemaking committee um, for the department, um, why should there be student loan defaults? Why should anybody default when you have these protections in place? There are a host of reasons here, but, but I'm going to talk primarily about a large one, which has to do with the companies that interface between the student and the U.S. Department of Education, who's the primary lender of federal student loans now. And those are the student loan servicers. The servicers have misaligned incentives where what's good for the servicer is not necessarily good for the student or good for the Department of Education. Um, I'm going to start with some basics um, because this stuff can get in the weeds and kind of uh, nitty-gritty <coughs> fast. So just some baseline stuff. Um, there are multiple kinds of federal repayment plans. When you first enter repayment on your federal student loans, you're going to be on a 10-year repayment plan, which takes the principal, looks at the interest rate, amortizes it over 10 years. Those are the payments that you're initially asked to, to start making. If you're having trouble making that payment amount, you can extend the term. Um, you can extend that to 30 years. This will obviously lower the payment, but increase the amount of interest you pay over time. And then there are also income-driven repayment plans. And there are a host of these, but the basic idea is that you pay 10 to 15 percent of your income, and you do that over a period of time, usually 20 to 25 years, and any amount that you owe at the end of that time is forgiven. Now, that structure is unique. You don't see a lot of financial products that are structured in that way. And one helpful way to think about it is it's more of a tax on income than it is a loan. You pay a certain percentage of your income for a set amount of time, and that is your obligation. Um, and there's a host of scholarship out there that, that goes into detail on that. But I think it's a helpful concept just thinking about what it is we're talking about here. Um, and I think, honestly, the Department of Education could do a better job of emphasizing those insurance-like aspects of IDR as opposed to simply the costs, right? Because interest continues to accrue, but you're not necessarily going to owe it at the end of the 20 years. Um, okay. The qualifications for IDR are varied. You need to figure out some, some basic information in order to figure out which plan you should be in and how to get into it. Do you have a FELL loan? Do you have a direct loan? Do you have a Parent PLUS loan? Are you married? If you're married, do you file jointly? Do you file individually? Um, do you have a hardship? Um, when was your loan originated? So going through these factors takes some time, right? You need to figure out all these facts in order to get into the plan. Um, an alternative to, to an income-driven repayment plan, if you're having trouble making your payments, is a forbearance. And this is something that doesn't have all those upfront questions, right? It's simply something that you're allotted a certain amount of, and you can say, I'd like a forbearance, and it's like a payment holiday. Interest continues to accrue, but you don't have to make your payments for usually a period of months. Um, 
but you get several of these, so it can quickly add up into years if you continue to use them. Now, another basic. What is a student loan servicer? Um, now, the Department of Education defines student loan servicers on their website. Um, some key points. The department says uh, the loan servicer, loan servicer will work with you on repayment plans. And if your circumstances change at any time during your repayment period, your loan servicer will be able to help. So the department is saying, if you can't make your payments, call your loan servicer. Um, now, servicers uh, often <coughs> parrot these exact same statements, right? They hold themselves out as experts on repayment for federal student loans. So they'll say, um, and this is a quote from a servicer website, if you're experiencing problems making your loan payments, please contact us. Our representatives can help you by identifying options and solutions so that you can make the right, the right decision for your situation. Right? So they're offering nuanced expert help on what type of repay repayment plan you should be in. Um, now, getting, getting more to the, to the conclusion here. <clears throat> What are the servicer's incentives? Servicer's main cost, or a large cost for the servicers, are call centers. These are you know, large operations where you have a lot of people on the phone answering call incoming calls from student loan borrowers who, ostensibly some of which you know, need help on repayment options. Um, servicers can reduce their cost significantly by reducing the call time that they have on each call. And they incentivize their representatives accordingly. If you have short average call times, you're eligible for bonuses. Um, what this means in practice is that the call representatives are incentivized not to go through the long series of questions that you need to answer in order to figure out where you should be on income driven repayment, but instead offer forbearances quickly and often because you can do it in under five minutes. Um, this harms borrowers. You need to make 20 years of qualifying payments on an income-driven plan if you're going to get that loan forgiveness. And so each month that you are in a forbearance, interest is continuing to accrue, and you're losing time towards that forgiveness. Um, That right there, start, you start to see why students default. Because instead of getting into these plans that are affordable and that will ultimately pay off the loan over a period of time, they're putting them into a series of forbearances that ultimately increase the loan balance and don't get the borrower any closer to ultimate repayment. 270 days, if you, if you don't pay for 270 days, you are technically in default on a federal student loan. And once borrowers who don't understand the system run out of forbearances, that's, that's really the countdown until the default. Um, now, even when somebody gets into an income-driven plan, if you go in, you know what you're looking for, you tell the servicer what you want, right? you force the issue and you get into the income driven plan, there are a series of hurdles that, um, problems that, that come up in the interactions with the servicer. So for example, each year you need to recertify your income in order for the <coughs> Department of Education to calculate your payment. Um, so you're not making much money one year, you might be on a zero dollar payment, you get a new job, you're making more, you have to recalculate so that you're contributing what you can from your income. Um, if you fail to recertify your income at the allotted time, you are kicked out of the program. Now, this has some negative consequences for borrowers uh, right away. Number one, your payment goes up dramatically. Um, number two, um, there's interest capitalization. So the interest that was accruing while I was paying less, while I was paying a $0 payment or, or less than the fully amortizing payment, has continued to accrue in the background. And when I drop out of the income-driven plan, that interest capitalizes onto the top of the loan, and I'm now 
that amount is used to calculate interest going forward. So you're increasing the amount of interest that's, uh, that's created from the loan. Um, there are interest subsidies where the government will pay those interest payments for a period of time. You lose those if you had those for your loan. Um, and one of the problems that we see from the servicers is that the communications on when these recertification dates come out are not clear. So instead of a subject line that says, hey, you need to recertify your income next month, it'll say, you have a new document on your Navient website. Click through to see your inbox, right? And then you have to go find your password. And you know, I think we've all dealt with this. And it's really um, a block to students successfully recertifying. Um, not all servicer communications are done in that manner. When you owe your bill, they'll say, hey, your payment's due. Pay us, right? And it'll give much more specific information. So um, again, problems on the servicing side. Um, we see it with private loans. Um, with private loans, you often have to have a cosigner. Most private student loans are um, underwritten on the cosigner, not on the student, because the student doesn't have uh, sufficient credit history. They may make more income after they get the degree, and so cosigners often ask for. In selling those loans and in selling the cosigners, the, the, the um, it's often highlighted that the cosigner can be released through a series of consecutive on-time payments. Unfortunately, what constitutes on-time for a cosigner release is often different than what constitutes on-time in terms of whether you're delinquent. So you could make a payment that's on-time and does not put you into delinquency, but is not considered on time for cosigner release. So for example, you get a, say, a 10-day grace period. Your payment's due at the first of the month, but if you pay by the 10th, you're fine. That doesn't count as on time for cosigner release. So uh, a lot of parents and, and older individuals, as, as highlighted by Professor Henderson, um, get stuck in these loans that you know, they were told they would be able to get out of, um, but are not because of the semantics used by the servicers. Um, Another problem we see is present amount due. So you, you might call up your servicer and say, I, I'm behind. Uh, what do I need to do to, to get current on the loan? The servicer's response, uh, in some instances that we've seen, is your present amount due is, and then they'll give you a figure. Present amount due, as defined by the servicer, is not the same as the amount to bring you current. Um, present amount due is the amount to bring you current plus your next payment. And this is not at all clear to borrowers when they're calling up. Um, so these misaligned servicer incentives are one of the problems that, that create defaults. I want to talk a little bit briefly um, as I wrap up here about what the states have done um, to address these problems. So first thing, offices like mine, the attorney general, state attorneys general, uh, have brought lawsuits. Um, Illinois, Washington, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, and California have all sued Navient um, for some of the practices that I, uh, that I just discussed. Um, there are also a series of state student loan servicing laws. Uh, and these are laws that are designed to get at the exact same conduct. So for example, Illinois passed a law that just went into effect on December 31st of last year. Um, one of the things that's required is if you're um, a borrower who's, at, who's defined as at risk, somebody who's delinquent, somebody who maybe didn't complete their degree, the servicers are required to have a specialist there that really knows the ins and outs of these income-driven plans. Um, servicers are not allowed to present forbearance as the only repayment option. Um, so there's a series of um, regulations that are designed to correct some of these incentive problems. Um, and then our law also um, created an ombudsman similar to what was seen at the CFPB. Um, another thing that states can do, uh, and, and there's a good example of this in Rhode Island, is to correct some of the, the problems with the federal system and their servicers 
at the state level as a model for, for how it could be done at the federal level. There's a lot of gridlock right now with Higher Education Act reauthorization, but uh, I think the federal government would do well to look at programs like the Rhode Island <laughs> Student Loan Authority's um, state lending program. Two touchstones there. First, Rhode Island services their loans in-house. This increases their cash flow and it aligns the incentives of the borrower and the lender in that Rhode Island wants to keep the students current. They don't want them in forbearances and then just falling out into default. They want them to keep paying. Um, and then number two, Rhode Island has a single IDR program. So if you start having problems with repayment, there's one program, you talk to the servicer who works for the state agency there, and they say, okay, we'll put you into the income plan. There's much less friction on that transaction. So um, I think there are some great state programs out there, and um, watch for more from the states on higher education. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dan Zibel. I am the chief counsel of the National Student Legal Defense Network. Uh, we are a, an organization, a nonprofit organization in D.C. We're about a year old, and we are dedicated to issues of consumer protection really across the student aid life cycle, focusing on predatory issues in, in the for-profit colleges and some of the student loan servicing issues as well. Uh, it is really great to be here today. I want to thank Professor Barr and the, and the Ford School. Uh, I'm an alum of the law school and just walking around uh, here over the past 24 hours has been uh, nostalgic and, and kind of fantastic. Uh, buildings like these weren't here when I, when I went to school, so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fantastic setup. Um, I, I think as Professor Henderson said, ba said best, the, the crisis here is, is huge, right? We, we hear the $1.5 trillion number all the time. That's about one trillion in growth over the last decade alone. Uh, more people are borrowing. Uh, more people are borrowing more. The average student let the average student is borrowing more money. Delinquency rates are high. Bankruptcy is impossible or virtually impossible to obtain. Uh, and there's lots and lots of causes for that. And I think uh, maybe fewer solutions right now. Uh, but what I want to offer some sort of comments on and, and thoughts on is sort of the role of, of the U.S. Department of Education in all of this, because that's the piece that we haven't, I think, focused that much on. And, and I offer these thoughts really as someone who used to work there. I spent three years in the general counsel's office focusing on issues of, of higher ed. Commissioner Chopra was there for, a, for some of that time. Um, and that was under Secretary, a little bit under Secretary Duncan, under Secretary King, and uh, the end of my time under the, the current administration. Um, during the, 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 the first chunk of that, um, I had served on the Obama administration's interagency task force on for-profit education. We helped do a, a, a lot of things, that the, uh, as I think uh, some of the other panelists were referring to during the, the last few years of the administration. Uh, starting to operationalize the gainful employment regulations. That, that had been sort of a multi-year effort in the courts, back down to the agency, back up in the courts, and finally uh, was, really, was really getting going. We set up an enforcement unit uh, designed to ferret out the kind of predatory practices by for-profit and other predatory institutions of higher education. Uh, and there was, a, there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on on student loan <coughs> debt relief. Uh, a lot going on on enforcement actions against some of the big actors, Corinthian, ITT, and many of the kinds of actors who were engaged in similar or almost identical behavior as the Corinthians and ITTs that very few people in this room will have ever heard of what these schools are. Beauty schools, trade, <laughs> other types of trade schools, uh, for-profit law schools, sort of, there, there's a whole host of, of players that never get the kind of press that Corinthian and ITT do, but they're out there, and I think those often get, get overlooked really because of the size and the scope and, and our attention span to, to pay on these issues. Uh, in contrast, the Department of Education in the last two years has taken a very different approach. Uh, there's been a lot in the world of regulatory rollbacks 
It's been mentioned a little bit, the gainful employment rule, uh, which really was designed to be a, a value proposition. Our students taking out a level of debt commensurate with their earnings. There's a debt to earnings ratio. Uh, that rule was in effect, it is still the law of the land. Uh, it is not being enforced by the current Department of Education and the department has to propose uh, in, a, in, a, in an NPRM that came out about a year ago, notice of proposed rulemaking, to uh, essentially select all and delete the rule. Um, the department has unlawfully refused to implement rules uh, designed to provide automatic debt relief to people who went to colleges, largely for-profit colleges, but all colleges that closed when they were there. Uh, that was the subject of litigation, and the department is slowly, finally, starting to implement that relief, uh, and we're seeing the fruits of, of litigation uh, just in the last few months. The department has unlawfully delayed the borrower defense rule, uh, including a class action uh, waiver, a ban on class action waivers, and a ban on mandatory arbitration that the department put in uh, in 2016. The department as I said, under Secretary DeVos, delayed the implementation of that rule. That has been found to be illegal. Uh, the department delayed what's called the state authorization rule, uh, which was designed to protect students who are enrolling in online institutions of higher, edu of higher education. Uh, I believe that that is also unlawful, uh, and we have summary judgment arguments in about three weeks in California where a judge will make that decision. Uh, the department has reversed course on one of the most controversial accreditors of for-profit colleges, an organization called ACICS. And that was something that Secretary King at the tail end of the Obama administration said, you are not doing your job well enough. You are no longer fit to be served as a department recognized accreditor, which for practical purposes means you can't get, you, as, a, as a school that is accredited by that accreditor, uh, if that accreditor is not recognized by the department, you are no longer, your students are no longer eligible to get Title IV aid, you know, Pell Grants, direct loans. So ACICS was out, ACICS was back in, and quite remarkably, even after letting it back in, it, or even when letting it back in, uh, it becomes clear that the department actually believes that ACICS uh, does not meet the federal standards for competency and conflict of interest. But lo and behold, ACICS is now a recognized accreditor by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the department has effectively dismantled the enforcement unit designed to ferret out the kinds of behavior that we've been hearing about. Uh, and then on the student loan servicing side, uh, we've seen the department argue forcefully that state consumer protection laws, UDAP laws, uh, can't be used against student loan servicers. So that's trying to stop the kind of lawsuits uh, that, that Illinois and Joe have been bringing uh, against Navient and other states, and it's also been trying to stop uh, lawsuits that private class actions and private uh, plaintiffs have used against the student loan servicers. Uh, the department has made that argument uh, in the Federal Register. Student loan servicers are sort of latching onto that. Uh, you can query the level of relationship there, uh, but that is the argument that's being made in the courts. It has been having limited success uh, I think every state AG has been able to fend off the preemption argument, uh, but there are a couple of cases that have come out the wrong way, uh, and those are now in the, in the courts of appeal, uh, including one that I argued last October, I think, and we're still waiting for a ruling from the Seventh Circuit um, on that. Similarly, uh, the logic also applies to the kind of student loan servicing bills that Joe was talking about, where the department is saying to states, hands off registration, licensing, hands off our student loan servicers. Those are federal contractors, states you have no role in protecting students uh, in this space. And on top of that, on the student loan servicing front, uh, there's a recent report from the Department of Education's Office of the Inspector General, which says that Ed is not actually doing a good enough job itself policing the student loan servicers. So you have the IG of Ed saying, you're not doing a good enough job. All the while, the Department of Education is saying nobody else is allowed to mm -hmm. oversee these servicers. So who's to do the, who's, who, who's left? Uh, as we think about that issue, and Joe mentioned briefly that the Higher Education Act is currently being debated for reauthorization, I think there's really a fundamental question that has to be 
asked, which is what is the role of the U.S. Department of Education in the student loan space, right? If we look back at the origins of student loans, it really, I think the modern system really dates back to post-World War II, the GI Bill, largely a grant system. Uh, the goal was opportunity and providing access. The goal was about the students, about education, workforce training. Uh, obviously, a lot has changed since then. Uh, you didn't have the Department of Education back then. Uh, that came about in the late 70s, uh, and there are still people at Ed who worked at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and have a, actually an, an amazing amount of knowledge about that, about that time. Um, and in the, I think it was in the late 90s when the Department's Office of Federal Student Aid was created as a performance-based organization, a PBO, under the, sort of the Al Gore reinventing government uh, concept and designed to give greater flexibility to the agency to act a little bit more business-like. And then later, you know, 2008, the financial crisis, the government switches to entirely a direct loan system rather than the system of guaranteed commercially made loans under the, what's called the FEL program, the family, Federal Family Education Loan Program. So that's a lot of change, right? And the question really is, is what is, where is the department in all of this? And is this the kind of program that the department as constituted right now really has the ability to oversee and oversee in a way that is effective? And I think one of the things that struck me over the past 24 hours sitting here in the room with, you know, so many sort of financial experts and the way I think a lot of people talk about banks and supervisory authorities and uh, all of the consumer protection that goes with sort of these complicated commercial lending products, auto loans, payday loans. Uh, you spend time with the Department of Education, they're talking a different language. Uh, they're talking about their customers, which are usually the schools, uh, or their customers are the servicers. I mean, Rohit's nodding along, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and there, are, there are tons of well-meaning people at the Department of Education, but it's, it's really, it's a different conversation that's happening there. And it's not a focus on, you know, how to best protect the students. It's protection of taxpayers, and whether that's working or not, we can talk about. But there's a lot of it is about protecting the schools and enabling the schools. And what if there's a bad school? Well, we can't shut the school down because what about the students who go there right now? The conversation is never about, well, what about the students who are gonna go there in two years, three years, four years, five years? It's about, what about the students who are there today, right now? And how do we protect them? Uh, and there's not a conversation about whether that's in the, 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 the best interest writ large. Now, there are exceptions to this. I think there were certainly exceptions in the, in the last few years of the, of the Obama administration when you saw Corinthian and ITT and even, even recently, we've seen exceptions to that, and uh, even this administration, I think, has a, a tipping point uh, with some of the Argosy University comes to mind uh, just in the past few weeks, where the <coughs> Department of Education said enough is enough. Uh, there's indications that you, we can't find, you know, 13, 16 million dollars of federal money. Uh, that's enough, uh, finally, for us to put you out of business, or at least take the Title IV aid away from you. But I do think that there's a fundamental question to say, what is, what is the role of the department? And as in the statute right now, the department has a role in contracting with servicers, overseeing servicers, overseeing accreditors, overseeing schools, deciding which schools can participate in Title IV, which schools can't participate in Title IV, which accreditors can accredit, um, what do the loan payment repayment plans look like, and all of that means the Department of Education is at the, the, the central focus point of a $1.5 trillion student debt portfolio. And as I hear the conversations that go on in DC about HEA reauthorization, there's lots of proposals, I, I think, at the, at the margins. And they're good proposals and good conversations that absolutely have to be having uh, about things like you know, incentive-based compensation for recruiters at schools, the federal 90-10 rule, um, you know, the use of, of you know, private rights of action in the HEA. These are all things that, that, that get discussed. But I, what I would like to see from the outside is, you know, what is, 
a broader conversation about what are we doing here, what is the role of, of the department, what is the role of the CFPB in all of this as the department has tried to edge out the, C the CFPB from its role in policing student loan servicing companies, what are the roles of states, states have proven to have a great ability uh, in this space and probably should have more of an ability uh, in this space, but they're under-resourced as well, and how do we bring that all together into a system uh, that, that works that works for students and then within the Department of Education, what can be done more on the supervisory side, on the monitoring side, you have program compliance, you have the same people are looking at, you know, the, the, the finances of institutions and are also looking at whether or not they're meeting their campus security requirements. These are very different things and very different skills and, you know, it shouldn't necessarily be the same people checking the box to make sure that your campus has all the blue lights that we all see around to also be making sure that you're not lying to students during the recruiting. Those are two different skill sets uh, that are required from the department. Uh, there's a lot that could be done um, on all of these issues and I really, you know, I, I fail a little bit in only asking some questions here and, and not providing a lot of answers. Uh, but I think it's a conversation that, that really needs to, needs to happen more. Uh, as I think Professor Henderson has said, the, the, the travesty here is with the students, and I think we have all heard from so many students who have been so deeply impacted by these issues uh, in their lives, and they're just clobbered with, with debt, and, you know, this is, you know, they are, they are truly sold, sold hope, I think, and, mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, they are not, they're, they're not only not, not given the promise of hope, they are, they are left paying for it but without anything to show for it. Um, so yeah, All right. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to our other two panelists, Sam and Joe. Uh, great, great presentations. Thank you all. Uh, Dan, I want to pick up, actually, on uh, the point you ended on, which is really the Department of Education. Um, it, it seems as if the department is captive of the uh, student loan services. And by the way, um, just so that the audience is aware of this, I think over the past, what, five years or so, the CFPB has received about 50,000 complaints about student services, uh, loan services, um, and the horror stories that they bring to the department uh, is really worth documenting. I mean, just to hear uh, the difficulty that the individual student has experienced in trying to get proper information and trying to really understand what his or her obligations are is really a, a chilling uh, story. Uh, I think uh, the moderator of our last panel, John Pato, said he did not want to be a source of gloom and doom. <laughs> <laughs> I think we don't want to end this conversation on a depressing note. But since the department is really at the centerpiece of much of this activity, including uh, its effort to preempt uh, both states and other federal agencies from getting involved, it really is at the crux of uh, how we uh, make these reforms. The question is, how do we do that? So I have some ideas, but I want to open it up uh, to <coughs> the two panelists for any suggestions you're willing to offer, and then I want to put something on the table uh, to consider. First, I, I think I just want to make certain we're on the same page. Would you all agree that the department is really at the key uh, to sort of trying to resolve this issue if we look for one major institutional player uh, to facilitate change? Sam, would you agree with that, Joe? Do you think that's true? Or do you yeah, that? no, they're, they're, they make all the loans, right? They're the, they, they approve the schools, they approve the creditors, they have all the money, um, they write all the regs, they enforce all the regs. They say nobody else can do it. I think they have the power, but not the will. Well, I think that's true. I think that's very true. There's a separate philosophical question. I'll just throw it out. If anyone wants to try to answer it, that's fine. But I want to go to the really important issue we teed up. The first sort of philosophical question is, why is the federal government making a profit in student loans? I mean, why? Given the magnitude of the debt, the indebtedness that we're talking about, 1.5 trillion dollars, 44 million people in default. Why is the federal government seeking to make a profit on something that should be an investment in the national future? And that's an issue that sort of looms large 
over the entire discussion. And we'll get back to that if you all want to try to address that in the course of your response. But trying to bring about reform of the Department of Education is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, no one of the organizations that I'm familiar with in DC as uh, non-governmental organizations, outside groups, has adequate stroke uh, to really bring about that reform alone. I'm looking at Congress, and my experience has been uh, that in achieving anything affirmatively, you have to have bipartisan support, guys. You can take you know, the votes of one party, and in this instance, the Democrats have control of the House of Representatives, and that will make a difference as we sort of pursue reforms going forward. But if you're really trying to accomplish something meaningful in an affirmative way, Bipartisan support. That's going to be a key issue. So I'm going to encourage everyone to sort of think <clears throat> about the challenge of, of really doing that. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, how do we do that? How do we do that? Uh, and I'm just throwing in uh, any ideas uh, because it's very true. The states are the laboratories of change in this area. The states are really far ahead of the federal government in looking for meaningful change. But obviously, if the states are preempted from dealing with some of the issues that we've talked about, they too will have difficulty. Any ideas in these lines? I, I think there actually may be a glimmer of hope in something you said during your talk. Mm -hmm. It didn't sound hopeful, but I think from a political economy perspective, it might be. You pointed out that even ARP, the AARP, is now being concerned about this issue. Absolutely. And I think that speaks to a deeper problem in this space, which is that our political system does not serve young people well. It doesn't. Um, you can say it's because we don't vote. You can say it's, I, I say we, I don't know if I should still be saying we, but you can say it's because <laughs> young people don't vote. You can say it's because young people don't contribute to political candidates. But the reality is our political system does not, we would never, what's happening to students now, what we've all been talking about, we would never let this happen to seniors. We'd never mm. let it happen. And now that it is happening to seniors, there may be hope that it could actually be a wake-up call, a bipartisan wake-up call, that this is no more acceptable for young people as it is for older Americans. Mm. And I think the seniors' point is, is relevant. As the ombudsman, I take in the complaints on this stuff and the amount of parents that call in with Parent PLUS loans as co-signers with their own debt is is remarkable. You get a lot of older people who are engaged and have this problem. Yeah. So I think, one, to piggyback on the seniors thing, the other thing we haven't really talked a lot about is uh, is veterans yeah. and the military. And you talk, I guess you did mention a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in the recruiting and the, and the, and the, um, the lead generation, but there is a huge incentive built in uh, particularly for for-profit colleges to target veteran population and it's under what's called the 90-10 rule which is provides that for-profit colleges can't get more than 90 percent of their revenue from the U.S. Department of Education. Let me say that again. For-profit colleges can't get more than 90 percent of their revenue from the Department of Education. But still that requires a loophole uh, and one of the loopholes is that uh, Department of Defense and Department of uh, Veterans and the VA Department, uh, that money doesn't count towards the 90%. So GI Bill funds count towards the 10%, which makes GI Bill funds incredibly valuable. And Department of Defense education assistance programs, uh, it's very valuable revenue for for-profit colleges. So I think one, the extent to which veterans populations are hurt is also something that can drive it up. But I think more fundamentally, we need people, I think, like people in this room who are experts in other types of lending products to really be focused on this issue. And this is not necessarily the, an issue that the higher education community can solve on its own, but people who have familiarity with you know, how did we look at mortgages and how did we think about mortgages? How do we think about auto loans? How do we think about all these other products? And what lessons can we draw from them? And what lessons can we draw from the other regulators to think about how best the Department of Education, if, it, if, if indeed it is the Department of Education, but how best to, to oversee and monitor these student loan servicers? Well, I think you've made a number of, of great points, guys. And I would say, uh, apropos of your observation about AARP and, uh, and the veterans, veterans groups, there are two other elements in Washington that I think 
are coming together as part of a new potential coalition that will help address these issues. Obviously, the groups represented here are part of that discussion, and um, organizations in the higher ed and civil rights community. But you also have the home builders who are expressing great concern that individuals who may be uh, eligible to purchase homes are delaying their purchases by about, on average, seven years because of student loan debt. You have the National Association of Realtors who are really concerned about their ability to continue to keep the home uh, market uh, building. All of that uh, is true. So I see the possibility of a new emerging coalition uh, coming together in part because of the uh, reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, which will likely be the legislative vehicle at the federal level uh, that will at least one of the central elements in addressing these issues. Secondly, um, I you know, again mentioned the importance of bipartisanship. I would say that clearly the Senate is going to be our big challenge in moving legislation forward. But I'm encouraged by the fact that Lamar Alexander, chair of the um, uh, uh, Education Committee in the Senate, Health and Education Committee, uh, is committed to reauthorizing the Higher Ed Act soon. Uh, Lamar Alexander has a history in this area, and I think we should uh, certainly lift him up because on issues of civil rights in the education context, he has been a leader. Uh, he and Patty Murray, the senator from Washington, are the chair and ranking member of the committee. And I have some sense of optimism that they will at least examine these issues closely if we can bring adequate attention uh, to the matter. But we're going to have to get the attention of Congress on this issue. And we're going to have to do it beyond uh, what we have done so far in providing general information. I, I thought this panel was so wonderful because a lot of this information has been known as a general matter, but pulling it together in a single forum where we have a conversation like this is a rare opportunity, <coughs> and I think we should take advantage of it. One of the hopes that I have coming out of this is that there will be a focused and detailed report on the role of the Department of <coughs> Education that will be, in essence, shared by a number of different constituencies, ownership of it that they will sign on to it, that they will help promote it, and that they will bring this report and the focus on the role that the department is uh, pursuing and not pursuing to the attention of a broader public. I think right now Secretary DeVos gets away with many of her actions because they are part of a, several groups of things that she's doing, some of which we have disagreement with, and yet none of it really has, has pierced the consciousness of policymakers in Washington, and until we do that, we're going to have a problem. So I'm looking to really bring people together to really lay out, in essence, a, a detailed analysis of the failures of the department in addressing these issues that can uh, enjoy the support, certainly of the uh, NGO community in Washington and many other influentials. Secondly, I would think, just as the state attorneys general, several of them, have banded together in collective action uh, in the past, that having state's attorneys general join an effort to highlight the wrongful role of the Department of Education could be helpful. Uh, I assume Lisa Madigan is still, she has stepped down, has she? Yeah, we have a new, uh, a new attorney AG? general uh -huh. in Illinois, uh, Attorney General Kwame Rao. Huh. And, um, you know, he has been, uh, continued the push on these issues um, and, uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of ideas that, that I think could serve as a template on the federal level. Yeah. States obviously fund higher education, and I think there are some unique ways that we could think about using income-driven repayment on the state level. <laughs> There's a lot of talk about free tuition plans, um, and these are good. These get back to your, your idea mm -hmm. of should the federal government make a profit. But I think income-driven repayment implemented correctly on the state level could show us a path where those who get the degree and go on to great success pay into the program, but that the program supports those who fall on hard times Absolutely. and doesn't overburden them with debt that can't be discharged in bankruptcy and that you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. So I think that states have an opportunity 
to create a template that could show the federal government the way forward? I think that would actually be very helpful. And, and just one note, um, recently I've seen some analysis that suggests that not all student loans are non-dischargeable in bankruptcy, that there are, they, loans have to conform to a certain standard in order to be non-dischargeable. And that some of the loans that students get, particularly those that go beyond the cost of tuition and books that actually provide more money uh, than necessarily the student would need to uh, uh, pursue his or her education can be discharged under appropriate circumstance. So I think there needs to be some clarification of what we do in that space going forward as well. Let, let, let's open it up uh, for a few questions if anyone has any. Any questions, guys? Okay. Please, go ahead. Uh, so a few days ago there was an announcement, or not an announcement, but there were news stories about a uh, decision, or like at least a policy change by the administration that uh, to reduce the total uh, limit on student lending uh, that, that, that is available. Uh, and there were news stories about this that mentioned that unlimited borrowing uh, just winds up encouraging schools to charge more. Um, I'm wondering if, you've, if any of you have seen the, uh, it, didn't it didn't cite any of the research, but uh, I'm wondering if you've heard of that argument and what's your take on it? So you're referring to a cap yeah. on the amount of student loans That's that correct. one student might get. Yeah. Colleagues? I, my response would be um, gainful employment is there for a reason, and that if schools overburden uh, students with debt, then they should have some skin in the game. Any others? Next question. Um, that was long. <laughs> I was going to ask about the public service forgiveness program as something that's really important to me because the main re plan, my career plan was built around it existing and continuing to exist hopefully. And I know it's one little corner of this giant conversation, but it does seem if we want to encourage people to continue following public service, so many, I just graduated from law school and I work at the law school and even as a lawyer, it was the most confusing process. I have like far more confusing than doing my taxes or anything else in my life mm -hmm. is trying to figure out, do, does my lender know that I'm in this program? I'm still not sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seems like that's just one person and I know plenty of people depending on it for their law school loans, depending on it for their med school loans, depending on it for you know, infinite things, and it just seems, it's one little slice, but I'm just wondering what no, a great the question. situation is. I mean, I think it's, that's, so there's a, there's a, one of the members of our, our team uh, who's a lawyer, uh, hearing her stories about what she has been dealing with in PSLF uh, and the, you know, the periodic employment certification forms that you have to fill out, it, it's sort of, it's eye-opening as to how challenging this is even for people who, like you, who are you know very highly educated and uh, and the like, and you know you can only imagine how hard it is for people who who don't have that background. Uh, it's it's one of the issues that's come up in the Massachusetts uh, Attorney General's action against uh, FIA, also known as Fed Loan Servicing, um, and it's uh, really at the core of one of the lawsuits that we have pending uh, in the 11th Circuit right now about uh, what happens and what are your, what are the, what, what are your, what's the recourse when a uh, servicer basically lies to you about whether or not you're eligible uh, for PSLF. You know, you call in, you say, am I on track? They say yes. Two years later, they say, yeah, about that, yes. Uh, we actually meant no. Um, and, you've been making, <laughs> and you've been making payments. But I, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly timely topic right now just because sort of the first chunks of PSLF, uh, you have to, under public service loan forgiveness, you have to make 120 consecutive qualifying payments. And we could debate what's qualifying and what's not qualifying, but 120 consecutive payments is 10 years. And the program started uh, a little over 10 years ago. So you're starting to see the first uh, sort of tranche of people who are eligible for student loan forgiveness uh, come due. And the reality is, is I think the numbers are something like only 1% of people who are uh, think they're eligible right now have actually 
uh, actually being granted mm -hmm. relief. That's correct. Uh, I think that number will probably trickle up um, over time, but it's, it's certainly quite low uh, at the moment. Well, even if it's tripled up, it'll still be 3%. It would, still be, I mean, it would have to go <laughs> up. Is, it's still pretty low. Guys, I, I think we would all agree that there needs to be a dramatic reform of the public service loan forgiveness program. There are too many people who we think should qualify uh, for loan forgiveness because they're engaged in what we think is public service in the most appropriate sense, and yet they are excluded. I don't think anyone would take issue, at least I hope not, with first responders, police, and fire you know, people, and teachers, and that kind of thing. But they're researchers engaged in cancer research. They're people who are engaged in medical support. I mean, all of that should be part of a larger set of reforms. What is missing is a sense of obligation to make those changes. The department knows that the problem exists and totally ignores it, totally ignores it. So uh, this is really such an important time to pursue meaningful reforms, and they've got to be calibrated to um, the people who have a power to do it. So if I were setting up a structure like this, which I'm involved in, uh, I would like to think that we'd look to people in Tennessee to talk to Lamar Alexander, get some really first-rate examples of what we consider good public service work that's not being recognized. Uh, we would focus on Patty Murray in Washington State and others trying to connect the stories of individuals to the actual members of Congress who sit on the appropriate committees. And I'm looking for uh, states where Republicans, they are represented by Republicans, particularly in the Senate. Uh, not because you are focused exclusively on Republicans, but we need I think it's fair to say Republican votes to make a difference, guys, to make a difference. So, you know, we've got to be very strategic about this. We have to really think through the better ways to make the affirmative case for change and then present that case backed up by a level of grassroots and grass top support that's missing from the debate. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I think there's a young lady right behind you, too. Yeah. We have time for a couple more, so we'll take one from her and then one from over here, if there is. Thank you. Um, my question is about consumer choice regarding loan servicers. So for example, you mentioned that there are um, pending lawsuits against Navient, who services all of my loans. Um, and so it's not clear to me whether consumers have any option to switch to a different servicer or we're mm. just sort of stuck with whatever we get. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, n no, you, you don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, um, you know, if, for example, if you want to pursue public service loan forgiveness, you can fill out what's called an employer certification form. That will automatically transfer your loan from Navient to FedLoan. Um, FedLoan has also been sued. Dan pointed out the Massachusetts attorney, attorney General has sued them for miscounting public service loan forgive, forgiveness payments and other types of income-driven repayments. So I don't know that I would qualify that as a choice. Um, but, you know, the misaligned incentives cross over the industry. And so, you know, I think that um, choice is, is something that, that, that could make a change, but it's not currently available. Did you still say? <laughs> Professor Henderson, it's been fascinating to hear you thinking out loud about how to put together a coalition mm -hmm. with regard to this. Um, this is not a subject I know anything about, so I'm, I'm asking a question in mm -hmm. addition. Um, do you have any data on the percentage of student loans that are held privately, either directly or through securitization, and how that relates to the 1.5 trillion figure? Because one of the things that we talked about in the financial crisis, along with misaligned incentives in the mortgage industry, uh, was an inability of the regulators to perceive how the uh, damage that was being done in the mortgage sector could possibly be translated into the larger financial system. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which unfortunately we all learned. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm wondering whether there's any aspect of the financial system that ought to have an interest in participating in the kind of thing you're talking about. That's a great question, a great question. I do not have that data. I'm going to pose the question to my colleagues to see if they do, but regardless of how they respond, we should have the data. And we should be able to, if we don't have it currently, that has to be one of the research topics that we pursue in trying to put together the affirmative case for change. Uh, there are institutions that I think are going to be very concerned about, uh, you know, this. we're ringing the alarm, if you will, about the problems of student loans. So I think some of the major banks, even though they may not be involved directly in student lending, have real concerns about I think we should be able to petition the Federal Reserve to take a look at this and with greater specificity. So it's a great question. Let me open it up. Anyone have that kind of data uh, indicating the degree of, of loans that are private loans versus those that are government issued? Do we have that sense? I, I do not have the data, so interrupt not me. Um, but what I think is interesting about your point more broadly, it's, it kind of reminds me of a point uh, Commissioner Chopra made earlier about auto loans and what he said is that there's not going to be some sort of cataclysmic event like there was in 2008 where the uh, auto loan the auto loan bubble collapses and banks collapse and you know we need aggressive intervention by the federal government we're not going to have that in student loans either um, it does not present the kind of risk ac acute risk to the economy that you saw with mortgage lending what it presents instead is sort of I think what, what you were alluding to earlier with a, sl a slow realization across the economy that people who are going to school and who are recently out of school are not able to buy homes, are not able to get cars, are, are stuck in jobs maybe that uh, are not sufficient to repay their loans. So it's sort of slow motion pain for our economy instead of the kind of cataclysmic event that I think would trigger the, the reforms we saw in the mortgage market. Yeah. Mike Calhoun. One, oh, one quick point to add to that. Um, there's a problem with a lack of data. The department holds a lot of the data on student lending. They don't share it. They don't make it available. They're now actively using uh, the Privacy Act to try to block both state banking regulators and state attorney general's offices from accessing that data. Um, and so I think just getting the information would be a starting point for, for an answer. So I want to follow up on the, the last comments and bring it back to where you started, uh, Wade, on the whole presentation. And that is, we are already well into that cataclysmic event for black communities, black students uh, with debt. Um, the numbers, some you shared there that you, first of all, one out of five black graduates, the success stories, are currently in default. And again, the default numbers, as was alluded to here, you've got to tease them out among the different sectors. But here, default means a really, really severe level of financial distress. So first of all, just the numerator and denominator, if you're in deferral, which means interest is running, you're not making payments, you're not included in the default calculation. And then to hit default, you're not deemed in default until you are 270 days late, nine months in the student loan world. So you're talking about people you, facing cataclysmic things, garnishment of wages, all kinds of other pressures. And then you look at the other uh, data, uh, the majority, it's near the majority of black students are making no progress on paying off the debt. So even if you're technically making payments, you are owing more than what you uh, started with when you came out of school and it is still growing. Not only is there no statute of limitations on collecting this debt, there's no statute of limitations on the interest accruing. And then uh, a, a study I've cited from a fairly staid uh, research organization, the Brookings Institute, their projection is that of black students with debt, which is close to 80% of black students, 
70% will default. And on top of all of that, connected with this is we see this as a lending institution, that it is the number one reason our black applicants for home loans uh, don't receive the mortgages. And even some of these programs, if you're in an individual repayment plan, you for 25 years, if you don't fall into one of the other circumstances, for many, you are excluded from participation in the mainstream financial system, like being able to buy a house. You know, your kids will finish school, hopefully, before you're able to even apply for a loan to buy a house. And so you've got the combination of the student loan debt paired with and feeding together with black home ownership, which is stuck in the ditch at the rate it was when the Fair Housing Act was passed and at a greater gap between black and white home ownership even than there was when the housing, Fair Housing Act was passed 50 years ago. So one of the things we struggle with at CRL, this is our main focus in this work, is how do we lift this up? Uh, because these problems are related to but at a different level and, uh, and in ways different uh, in kind than others. So too often we see like a fourth of black students go to for-profit colleges, which have about a 90% adverse outcome uh, for that group. So you start out with that whole segment. A lot of, there are a high number of, of black student borrowers who have relatively small amounts of student debt, five to $10,000, but they have no increase in earning capacity they were living paycheck to paycheck before they undertook this program and took on that debt. And so the fact that it's a small amount of a debt makes it in a lot of ways no less of a financial albatross uh, for them. So I think we need to both lift up this issue and focus on black home, uh, the, the black student borrowers and look at the things that help them the most, you know, refinancing at today's interest rate is not going to be a primary. It's a great thing to do maybe, but it costs a ton of money and it's not going to principally help these black student borrowers, for example. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do we, you know, we've got one group that we need to triage this in some sense. We've got one group that really is being hammered by this. And I worry as we search for the global solution, those folks are left lying, mm -hmm. dying in the waiting room. Well, that's a very, <laughs> Sobering, yes, final comment uh, for the <laughs> afternoon, guys. I mean, obviously, we have just scratched the surface of what is a really important national debate. Uh, this is a crisis hidden in plain sight, but it's affecting more and more Americans across uh, racial lines, uh, but certainly with a disproportionate effect on African Americans, other communities of color. Uh, but again, I think this is having such a broad impact. The solution is potentially within reach, but this is an organizing challenge as well as a substantive argument challenge. We're going to have to think through how we organize ourselves and those who share our view more effectively to impact policymakers in Washington while the opportunity presents itself. This reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act is a good thing. The initiatives that are taking place in the states are good things. These are the laboratories of change. Uh, getting uh, ideas from the attorneys general who have worked collectively together on a number of issues and may be able to shine a light here. And thinking through how we bring political pressure to bear from grass tops and grass tops organizations that have an interest in these issues but don't necessarily see themselves as being active players. We're going to have to bring them in from the sidelines and recruit them to be engaged in these efforts. So with that, I'm going to bring this panel to a conclusion. Please join me in thanking three extraordinary panelists. So I'm, I promise our uh, agenda has me talking for a half an hour, but I promise that is not true. Um, I just want to give um, some brief uh, closing remarks. What a, what a terrific um, panel uh, we just had. It, it, um, 
it and the last two days um, have left me in a spirit that I um, was not intending um, when I organized the conference, which is unbelievably angry. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, our time together and the work that we can do together uh, going forward will channel that anger, which I'm sure many of you share, into a, um, a constructive path, a path that um, helps us uh, get out of um, the mess that we continue to be in, um, in helping and serving um, households um, in the financial sector, um, not just with their student loans, but as we've discussed in in so many aspects of their lives. And I, I want to thank, um, uh, first and foremost, um, Christy Baer and Tracy Van Dusen for getting us all um, uh, through these uh, two days in, in such good shape. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, Christy and Tracy had a lot of helpers. I'm not going to name them all again, but wonderful students and staff from uh, across the Ford School have been involved in this effort, uh, getting you all here and uh, making the conference work, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, uh, to them as well. And, and lastly, I just want to uh, give my thanks to all of you, the speakers and panelists and audience um, who have been on this journey with us for a couple of days. Uh, it's been um, amazing for me um, to have the, um, the privilege of uh, learning from you these last couple of days and to be able uh, to step away a little bit from my day job and refocus on the set of issues that I care deeply about. So um, thank you to all of you for being here and for your contributions. Um, I just have a, a small bit of uh, logistics to let you know about. Um, if you wouldn't mind with your taking your name badges and dropping them off with Tracy on the way out, we recycle them. Um, if you have other uh, conference materials you want to recycle, um, please also use the recycling bins um, for those for paper. Um, if you um, need any logistics help at all on your exit um, this afternoon, please see um, Christy or Tracy on the way out, and she will, as you've learned, take very, very good care of you um, and safe uh, travels and journey home.